So during certain uh, times of the year, there are certain passages or stories from the Bible we read and ponder. During Advent and Christmas, we look at the birth stories and about uh, Jesus' second coming. On Good Friday, we read the crucifixion texts. And on Easter, of course, we celebrate and read the resurrection accounts with much joy. And like all those days, on Pentecost, we read uh, Acts 2, and we remember the day that is considered the birthday of the church, as the Spirit Jesus promised when he ascended is now poured out on the believers to equip and empower his church to be who he's called them to be. And this is all part of uh, God's story, the, the Jesus story that we as Christians are called to follow, to live our lives by, to be consumed by, to dedicate our heart, soul, mind, and strength to. And my goal as a pastor, what I desire more than anything, is to lead a group of people who would say, I want to live my life according to this story. Every minute, every hour, every day, every week, every month, every year, every season of my life would revolve around this story, kind of this calendar of events, and then my place in them in this time in history. And the reason, you know, the story is beautiful and as inviting as it is, the reason it doesn't sometimes find more attraction is, you know, because people aren't always necessarily jumping in uh, to this story because it asks something of us to, you know, restructure who we are and what we value. And I long for, you know, everyone to come on this journey. But this journey involves sometimes forsaking all to follow Jesus. Sometimes letting go of our worldly possessions. It involves forgiving one another. Staying in community that is sometimes difficult. Bearing one another's burdens. Being more concerned with the interests of others than our own interests. And so much more. In summary, we don't get to be our own God control our own story. But when we know the goodness, grace, and love of Jesus as experienced by the outpouring of his spirits, well, we can begin to desire all of these things, to forsake all for Jesus. It doesn't mean it's easy, but the Spirit enables us to begin to pray bold prayers like, God, teach me to love as you love, faithfully, patiently, generously. Show me your heart to say, God, I want to feel what you feel, know what you know, see what you see. And that intimate bond with Jesus through the spirits is what Pentecost is all about. So with joy and anticipation and attentive hearts, would you stand with me and, and enter into this story from Acts chapter 2, the coming of the Holy Spirit, starting in verse 1 where it says, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? And then it lists all the languages and nations represented there. In our own languages, verse 11, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, eh, they're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk. It's nine in the morning. <laughs> no, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. 
In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even upon my servants, both men and women. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. This is the story of Pentecost and the word of the Lord. So I want to speak this morning to three things. How Pentecost unites, verses 1 through 11. How Pentecost can divide, verses 12 and 13. And then most importantly, how Pentecost revives, verses 14 through 18. So let's start with how Pentecost unites. The roots of Pentecost are in bringing people together in a common experience and uniting them together in purpose. It says here in verse 1, they were all together in one place. And they were, came from quite far away to be there, some of them. And we can't always draw exact parallels between times. And I realize we live in a, in a different culture with different communication and technology. But still, there's something to be said about the fact that they were physically together. It doesn't say, you know, they were all writing letters and communicating long distance. No, there was something powerful about them actually being gathered together. And I thank God for some technology that allows us to stay connected, to worship online when needed, and, or to help reach new people or people who otherwise wouldn't be worshiping at all. I mean, that's why we're committed to having and keeping and developing more our online service and digital presence. You know, we'd be neglecting our duty to be a light and to do everything we possibly can to get the gospel to as many people as possible if we weren't expanding our digital reach and meeting people where they are. But eventually, the goal is to move people toward being all together in one place. For Christian history teaches us that that's when revival happens, where people are transformed, is when we can be singularly focused in a physical space and place set aside to worship, where those around us are committed to the same thing and seeking God, and it kind of becomes contagious, where we can feel and sense and see what the Spirit is doing. I mean, that's just huge. I wrote a little about this in our our e-newsletter this week, and if you're not signed up, make sure uh, you do. You can do that from the homepage of our website. But we can't say we love Jesus and stay separate from his church. Loving Jesus draws us into fellowship with his bride. And here at Pentecost in Acts, there are people and visitors gathered together from all the nations, and the outpouring of the Spirit begins to unite these different people together. And there's such a simple yet profound and challenging truth here that we cannot be Pentecost-style Christians, which we're all called to be, and not prioritize, value, participate in, and love the gathered Christian community, faults and all. But not everyone gets it, and so to some extent, Pentecost divides. It says here in verse 12, all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, They're filled with new wine. So the Spirit can make us feel a little bit uncomfortable in a way because the Spirit surprises us. The Spirit is not easy to categorize and certainly cannot be controlled, which can challenge our sense of control. The Spirit throughout the Scriptures, both Old Testament and New, is is talked about or compared to the wind. And of course, we can't control the wind, where it blows, what direction, when it blows. So the outpouring of the Spirit can often divide between true seekers who sincerely ask, like in verse 11 here, what does this mean when they see the Spirit being poured out? And it can divide between them and skeptics and sneerers who say here in verse 12, they're drunk, you know, they're they're crazy. I mean, the Spirit will confront us with whether we desire to live a life of the flesh or a life of the spirits. 
In John 16, verses 7 through 11, where Jesus talks about how he's going to send the promised spirit, he tells us the spirit will come and actually show people where they are in the wrong, reveal their sin. And so the spirit divides in a way, both in our own souls internally, between living a life pleasing to the flesh or living a life pleasing to the spirit, as well as communally, and that it forces people to make a decision about what they're living for, what they value, what they do with their time and money and passions and energy. And the conclusion of some might be, as it is here, those people are crazy, right? Wasting their time on that Jesus stuff, dedicating themselves to the interest of others, living their lives for something beyond themselves. They're foolish, Galatians chapter 5 verses 16 and 17 and there's lots of passages like this in the New Testament but it says walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh for the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. The Spirit can divide because we realize we can't follow Jesus, but then do or live however we want. Can't follow all the whims and trends of the culture around us. Again, we can't be our own God. So where I want to land this morning, and and one of my favorite things to talk about is the third point then, that Pentecost revives. It unites, it can divide, but ultimately the goal is to revive. I love the vision of Pentecost, for it revives the church and brings with it such renewal and a reordering of how we do things, who's involved, and so much more. So let's just look at the groups mentioned in this text and how it revives people in every situation from different walks of life. First, let's talk about young and old. Verse 17 says, Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. The message of Pentecost is multi-generational. And I love this little couplet here. God's desire for his church and the evidence of the work of the Spirit is that generational divides and age limitations are broken down when the Spirit is poured out. First, it says, your young men will see visions. And visions were or are a quality associated, you know, with spiritual maturity. For the wise and kind of seasoned veterans, those with experience and age who can, you know, see with objectivity. But here God is announcing that when his spirit falls and gets a hold of a young person, their clarity of God-given vision and insight will amaze us. So that the only explanation can be the Spirit of God is at work among us. And we will stand amazed as the voice of the young and inexperienced see visions and articulate wisdom beyond their years as they are enabled by the Spirit. Don't you long for children and preteens and youth and high schoolers to prophesy? to speak truth, to bring clarity to God's words? Don't you long for young adults to challenge us and lead us in their passion and intensity for Jesus? I mean, for all that, I say, come, Holy Spirit. Pray it over our homes and our families and especially our church. But this doesn't mean the old are left out. On the contrary, it says, Your old will dream dreams. And dreaming dreams was, you know, and is a quality associated with kind of the passionate pursuits of youth and their imaginative engagement with the world. You know, it's young people that are normally full of dreams and hope and optimism, dreaming vivid dreams of what they can do, imagining a world that is otherwise, believing they can change it and that anything is possible. But here God is announcing that when God's spirit falls and gets a hold of an older person, whether or not you're in that category is, I guess, up to you. But their passion for life, their youthful vigor, their God-sized dreams for God's kingdom will amaze us. 
so that the only explanation can be the Spirit of God at work among us. So in the body of Christ, older folks, they're not done. They're not stepping aside. They're not taking it easy. No, they are revived. The Church of Pentecost is a church where older people are not pushed to the margins with nothing to contribute, leaving the work of God to the young and energetic. Rather, we will stand amazed as those who are older are dreaming dreams for God's church with youthful passion, energizing the church as they are enabled by the Spirit. Similar to the outpouring of God's Spirit being for young and old, it's also for men and women. Verse 17 and 18, Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirits in those days. I'll keep my remarks here short because we just talked about this a little bit on Mother's Day. But just to be clear, the Church of Pentecost, and therefore this church, equally affirms the full and equal calling and equipping of God upon both women and men without limitation. And anything less is to limit the message of Pentecost and God's Spirit. And hopefully at home you say, Amen. But as a prophetic community, we discern God's voice equally through both male and female leaders, preachers, and teachers as a sign of God's spirits at work. And then lastly, the message of Pentecost tells us God uses and pours out his spirit upon both the haves and have-nots. This applies to, you know, race, class, socioeconomic status, ability. God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people, all flesh. All divisions between gender, age, race, or socioeconomic status are to be erased. God never intended there to be haves and have-nots or rich and poor in his kingdom and his church. That's why we find when the Spirit is poured out in Acts 2, the result is, verse 44, they had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone in need. Pentecost revives us from young to old, rich to poor, no matter our ability or disability, education or lack of, race, status, privilege, the outpouring of the Spirit breaks down barriers and brings us all together. And part of the message of Pentecost is that you are not too young, too old, too broken, too damaged, too poor, too lost, too hurting to be invited into what God is doing. But we need a fresh outpouring of His Spirit. We cannot manufacture these things. And Pentecost is not just an event. It is an experience. And I've been challenged this week and really the past few weeks to renew my focus and realize that what we need and what I need more than anything as a church is an outpouring of God's spirit. Because here's the truth. God can do more in five seconds than we can do in five years of trying harder. And COVID has, you know, challenged us greatly as a, as a church, as a community. It's brought so many difficulties. It's, it's worn us all out to an extent. It's strained relationships. It's made us weary. It's sometimes clouded our vision. But I'm asking God to revive us by his spirit like the day of Pentecost. To bring the healing we need. To teach us to let go of whatever we're holding on to. To come and to revive us. Because I don't want to be defined by this past year, or by COVID. I want to be defined and marked by the Spirit of God. And so we're asking the wind of the Spirit to come and blow fresh upon us. And I hope that you want that. And so we're going to sing a new song that calls out for this this morning. And as we sing, we're going to invite the Holy Spirit to come fall upon young and old, men and women, have and have nots, wherever you are, rich and poor, for the Spirit to come 
and I realize we're not in a gathered context here in our online service and it's a little different, but you may just want to pace around your living room. You may want to get on your knees on your couch and, and just yell out the words to this song. You may want to groan in the spirit and ask for an outpouring of God's spirit, not only upon you, not only upon your family, not only upon Oceanside Community Church, but all over Vancouver Island, over British Columbia, over Canada, and over the whole world. We need a fresh wind of God's Spirit to renew us, to revive us, to unite us. And so we say, come Holy Spirit. When the story of Pentecost, there's a transition where people are asking first in verse 12, what does this mean? And then in verse 37 to asking, what should we do? And so we've explained what this means and we've hopefully experienced the spirits. But now the question is, what should we do? And the result is later in Acts 2, Peter gives this sermon explaining what this all means. And it says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent. Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what's the response to the outpouring of God's Spirit? Well, number one is to repent of our sins, to change our ways, to experience that transformation. So we're not here gathered together in this service where you can kind of publicly do this. But one way you could do it, and any one of these three things I'm going to mention, is just to write in the comments, I repent of my sin. To say, Lord Jesus, come and forgive me. And we will respond to you and just acknowledge that you've done that. And it's just a public way to say, I am responding to the Spirit of God. Second is to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit just as Peter says here. And maybe that's you and you, you just want to say and want to write there in the comments, I want more of the Holy Spirit. And there are many ways and shapes this can take. Here in Acts 2, you see that they began to uh, supernaturally speak in other languages, what we call kind of speaking in tongues. And it's a beautiful, intimate experience of connecting with Jesus and, and groaning with what Romans calls the, the, the groanings that are too deep for words. That because of just being overwhelmed by the mystery of God, we just begin to pour out our hearts. This language comes out. And sometimes when the Spirit falls, there is this verbal response. And so I encourage you, wherever you are, to seek that. To say, God, if this is from you, I want more of your Holy Spirit. And just let the words begin to flow. And then the third response here is Peter says, be baptized. So it's not just what happens internally, but I love this couplet where Peter says, repent and be baptized. That we can't just have what happens inwardly to us not affect our outward action. And so he says, show it outwardly, be baptized. And so we would love to baptize you. In fact, we will do it next Sunday. We received such an encouraging email this week from someone who's been watching our live stream now for several months. And we've never met them, but they live in the area. And they said, I feel like God's calling me to step out and be baptized. And so we're hoping to baptize this person next week. But how awesome is that? That God's spirit is reaching out into the community through this live stream and in other ways. But why don't you join us next week and be baptized if you haven't. If you're serious about following Jesus, then why not? So we'd love to meet with you this week and we can give you an application. Just go ahead and send us a message on any of our platforms and we'll make sure we get in touch with you. But I just want to give you a chance to take a couple moments here and the band's just, I think, going to sing a chorus and I might just stay up here with them, but to pray over one of these things or maybe all three to just press in and, and whether it's you need your sins forgiven, maybe for the very first time reaching out to Jesus right now. Maybe you've never heard this message before. You've never experienced a service like this and you just need to reach out and say, Jesus, forgive me. And maybe you just want to call out for more of the Holy Spirit. We've already been doing that, but just saying, Lord, I need a flood of your spirit upon me. And maybe you need to seriously pray about being baptized if you haven't. To say, Lord, give me the faith to step out in obedience. So let's just take a minute or two to respond to this. 
in the quiet place of your home or wherever you are walking around. And then I'll close us with a benediction. But let's pray for more of the Holy Spirit. Pray through these things. Just praying for forgiveness to be poured out. The baptism in the Spirit to be poured out. And even that we would be flooded with the waters of baptism as a sign of that repentance. All of this themes and imagery, they flow together. Baptized in the Spirit, baptized in water. means to be immersed, to be soaked in the presence of God. final follow-up just sticking with Acts 2 as it says here toward the end that they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching into fellowship to the breaking of bread which probably referred to both meals together but as well as an allusion to the Lord's Supper and to prayer so as additional follow-up I encourage you to go ahead dedicate yourself to the teaching of the Lord begin to read his word. Go ahead and if you want to start in Acts, then just start there and read the story of the early church and begin to pray through that and ask for God to reveal himself. Devote yourselves to the breaking of bread, to fellowship, to this gathering together, to being here, to doing communion together, and then to prayer, to praying both individually and communally. And we're going to be uh, doing a little more prayer in June and having a prayer gathering more probably outside Uh, as we move forward. So we want to continue to seek the Lord together. Thank you for seeking him with us this morning. Be praying for our 11 o'clock as we seek the Lord again. And let's continue to pray this week together that God's spirit would be poured out, that it would rain forgiveness and grace and hold the Holy Spirit upon us, that we would see transformation and baptisms and the sign of new life in our community. So we're excited for that, for where the Lord is taking us. Happy Pentecost to you. Take some time throughout the day to continue to celebrate the birthday of the church. Blow up a balloon, slice a piece of cake, (laughs) whatever you want to do. But let's keep our minds on this story that we are involved in and moving forward in it. Be blessed. May God's grace be with you. Amen.